Hey, brother, how are you? I'll just talk to these people over here. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. <laughs> hey, I love it. I do. I've been to churches where people come in and it's so cold, it's frozen, nobody's talking to each other. So, hey, it's good to be here with people that you want to talk to. Amen. And I'm glad we were able to get here today. Evidently. All you people, except for this bunch right here, they couldn't find gas this morning. <laughs> but you did. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, glad to have... Did anybody come to have church today? Because I did. I came to have church this morning. Okay, so we're going to do that. Let's get into the prayer list and then we're going to get started. I want you to pray for Jeff Lauder, please. He's been in and out of the hospital. He's been dealing with pneumonia, things like that. Be lifting him up. Paul and Janet Vaughn, they want to come back to church so badly, but for health reasons, they just can't get here yet. Please be praying for them. Miss Irene Haynes, she's been in the hospital this week. Please pray for her. Kathy Morgan, Vicki Patterson, please continue to pray for them. Uh, I want to, uh, not, not to embarrass her, uh, but Melissa Stepp, it's good to have you and Steve back with us this morning. She lost her mom a couple of weeks ago. Please be praying for Melissa and her family, especially her dad, Woody. Be lifting him up in your prayers. Uh, Patricia Price, uh, that's Karen Bradley's mom. She's dealing with breast cancer. Please be praying for her. Brenda Rumpel, uh, Kathy Ballard, Aileen Billado, please be praying for them. Uh, Sarah Brigman, that's Anthony's daughter-in-law. She has cancer starts treatments this week. Please be praying for her. I, I've got person after person who is sick. Let, let's just be lifting one another up. Amen. I know there's people watching us on Facebook this morning. You have prayer requests. Send them to us. We'll, we'll be praying for you. Anybody here have an unspoken request this morning? I have several. If you're able, let's stand up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for letting us be here. We thank you for church. We thank you for one another. We thank you for you, Father. Thank you for loving us so much you sent your son to live and to die and to be resurrected for us. We thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray that your spirit would just fill each person here this morning, Lord Father. Let everything that we do lift up and glorify the holy name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for the music. I pray for the worship. I pray for the word. I pray for the sermon. I pray for the fellowship. I pray for the people, Lord Father. I pray that you would just take this hour that we would forget about ourselves, forget about our problems, our issues, our worries. And Father, let us focus on you. Let it be all about you, Father. Lord, we love you today. We pray for anyone and everyone who is sick and afflicted. Anyone who is suffering from grief today, Father. We lift them up to you. Lord, Father, we pray most of all for that person who has never given their heart to Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they make a decision for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Did anybody in here besides Kurt bring their voice? I know Kurt brought his. I saw it. Anybody else bring a voice to sing with? Amen. Let's worship. You know, God is so good. And this first song is King of My Heart. So 
Is he the king of your heart today? So y'all listen to this song.
It's okay to say amen again if you like that. Amen. Thank you, praise band. Appreciate that so much. Appreciate you being here today. Um, Brian and Noah are going to put it up on the screen for us. But if you brought your Bible or if you use your mobile device or whatever to get to God's Word, I'm going to invite you to go to 1 John Chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 15. I'm actually hearing some pages turn. Amen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 1 John. That's toward the back of your Bible, just in case you need to know. If that helps. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this. Is that all right? Y'all care if I preach a little bit this morning? This is going to make somebody uncomfortable. I'm just going to tell you, somebody's not going to like it. But God told me to tell you just like it is. Okay? Put your seatbelts on. Because I normally don't say this, but I'm going to step on somebody's toes today. Y'all ready? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, love not the world. I can stop right there. We could take up another offer and go to the house. Yeah. Love not the world, church. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Man, God is serious, isn't he? He says, don't love the world, don't love the stuff in the world, because if you do, you don't really love God. Not my words, His. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Everybody say amen. amen. 
Now, somebody's sitting here, and you're looking at me, and you're going, Pastor, why is John telling us not to love the world when God made such a beautiful world? And he did. I've been blessed to travel a little bit in my life, not as much as some of you, but I've been around the block, and it's always good to come back home to Western North Carolina because I personally think this is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I cannot look around these mountains and these hills and these valleys and say there is no God. Amen. For there to be something so beautiful in this creation, there, there had to be a creator. But somebody's going, how come, how come God doesn't want us to love his world? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you some answers here. In the Bible, the word world has different meanings. Okay, Sometimes it does refer to the physical earth that God created for us. And it is indeed a beautiful world. Amen? That's not what he's talking about in our scripture though. Sometimes the word world refers to you and I. Us. People. For example, in John 3.16, it said, For God so loved... Let's try that again. I believe y'all know this one. I'll give you a minute. For God so loved the world. Y'all going for bonus points now, aren't you? Okay, the world there is, is you and I, us, okay, people. But right here, the word world comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means order, arrangement, a system. Church, the world has a system that operates differently from God's kingdom. Do you believe that this morning? Okay. There, there, there's, there's, there's God's kingdom and then there is the world. Okay. All right. A few decades ago, I committed my life, recommitted my life to Jesus Christ. And I got serious about living for Him. And... I learned very quickly that the Christian life, living the Christian life, is no bed of roses. Amen? Amen? You see, I thought, because I was young and I was naive, and I didn't understand the kingdom of God and the world that I was living in and being influenced by, I thought that when I recommitted to Christ and I got serious about God, that He would make everything good in my life. I wouldn't have to worry about my problems anymore. I wouldn't have issues with people or situations or things like that anymore. Things would be good. My problems would disappear. It didn't take long for me to realize that I'd been lied to. Someone once said this, living the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. Let, 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 me, let me tell you something, church. Get serious about Jesus Christ and see what happens. Amen. Just see what happens. Okay? Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I had heard about the devil before I got serious with my walk. I'd heard about him. I knew he was real. But when I got serious, I met him. He came after me. If the devil never bothers you, then you need to figure out if you're really walking with God or not. Okay, because I can promise you, when you get serious, I know I keep saying that, but when you get serious about your faith, about your walk with Jesus Christ, some demon's going to come up behind you and put a bullseye on your back. And he's going to shoot for you every day. But that's okay. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen? Here's my point, folks. There's a, there's a, a struggle. There's a war going on. Do you all believe that? There, there's a struggle, a war. We don't always see it here in the physical realm, but it's very real in the spiritual realm. As Christians, God wants to help us. He wants to bless us, and he wants to guide us in, in his paths and in his plans for us i seen him do that in my life again when i got serious about my walk 
I could see where God was trying to do something in my life. Okay? But here's what happened. This world kept trying to pull me back. Anybody been there before? As I'm trying to walk with God, at the same time, the world keeps trying to pull me back into its system, into its way of thinking, into its way of operating. Church, listen, the world we live in has ideals, values, philosophies, and priorities that oppose God. Do you believe we live in a, in a world that opposes God? Let, let me make it, make, let me make it uh, more personal for us. I can't talk about other countries, other nations. I'm not there. I don't know what's going on. I'm talking about the United States of America, our country. Do you think it's trying to push God away? Amen. It is. The world is opposed to God. We can see this opposition, this war happening right before our eyes. Turn on the news. Turn on the television. And you are being, gosh, this is preachy. You're going to be indoctrinated. You're going to be told what to believe. Oh gosh, parents, keep your children in church. Keep them close to the Lord. I see lots of little ones here, kids and grandkids. Keep them close to the Lord, folks, because the world is trying to indoctrinate your children. Trying to pull them away from Jesus Christ. The world that you and I live in, they want us to believe that God doesn't exist. They want us to believe that, that God isn't the creator, that all of this just happened, you know, somehow, by accident. They want us to believe that the Bible is just another book and it's long outdated and you should throw it away. It's no good anymore. They, they, they want the world to believe that, the, that people of faith are, are, are backwards. That were ignorant. And, and I've even had people tell me I'm stupid for what I believe in. They want, the world wants us to believe that, that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. And that you're intolerant. You're bigoted. You're narrow-minded. If you believe that way. If you have, listen to this church. If you have a biblical view. Everybody say biblical view. If you have a biblical view of marriage sexuality and gender then you're a hater and you should be canceled by our culture we see it we see it people's lives are being destroyed every day on social media and all this stuff because we don't believe like the world believes the world wants us to believe that the number of likes you receive on social media, that determines your value. Let, let, me, let me talk to some teenagers here uh, th this morning. I have talked to teenagers in the past who are just devastated. Their lives are ruined, they think, because they don't have as many likes as their girlfriend or their boyfriend or somebody said something bad about them on social media. Beloved, that don't mean squat. It's only God's opinion that matters in this world. Our world wants us to believe that how you look is more important than how you conduct yourself. The world is constantly telling us, live like we do, and your life will be great. Let me, let me ask you, just, this isn't even in my notes. This is... What's your worldview today? Do you have a secular worldview or do you have a biblical worldview? Only you know the answer to that. But let me tell you, one leads to life and one leads to death. I'll tell you that right now. But the world is, they're constantly telling us, live like us and your life will be better. Television commercials don't sell products. They sell lifestyle promises. Buy our car and you'll be the envy of your neighbor. Ladies, wear this 
perfume. And men will actually walk into buildings because they can't see where they're going. They'll be so blinded by your sin. And men, you drink our beer because if you drink our beer, then bikini-clad ladies will magically appear at your house. That's what they're telling us, isn't it? They're not selling beer. They're selling ideals. They're not selling perfume. They're selling values. Television programs. Oh, I love to watch a funny sitcom. And there used to be some good ones. But now everything has an agenda. They're trying to indoctrinate you. Listen, church, they call them programs for a reason. They're programming you. We're going to keep showing you something that you know is biblically wrong, but if we keep showing you enough, then you're going to accept it. Television program. They program us, and they've been doing it for decades. That's why much of this generation in their teens and 20s, we've lost them. Because they don't have a biblical world view anymore. They believe what they're told on social media and on television. And they accept it. Church, here's the question you and I have to answer this morning. Right, right here. We have to answer this morning. Okay, Do we love God or do we love the world? We have to decide. Well, preacher, I don't want to decide. You have to decide. If you're... If you're serious about your Christianity, you have to decide. Brian, why can't I just have both? Why can't I love God and love the world? Well, church, here's the thing. God doesn't allow any fence sitting. He doesn't allow it. He's an all or nothing God. He says, you're all with me or you're all against me. Well, Brian, I don't like that. Well, that's the way it is. Not my rules. It's God's rules. In James 4, 4, here's what we read. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Not my words. These are God's rules. Do you love God? Or do you love the world? And you can't have it both ways. See, I told you I'm going to mess somebody up this morning. Because somebody here, you really love the world. You love its values. You love the freedom you think you have in the world. Pastor, why is God so demanding? Why is He so harsh about this? Why does He demand that I either, I either love Him or I love the world? Because God knows that if you give in just a little bit, even a little bit into the world, the world will eventually take you over. He wants you to love Him because He knows what's best for you. And let me tell you a truth this morning. The world doesn't give crap about you. I know I shouldn't say that in church, but sometimes that's the only way I can get your attention. The world does not care about you. Let me tell you a story about a mule. And ladies, I'm not talking about the one you rode to church with this morning. <laughs> this mule had a name. His name was Old Pete. Old Pete belonged to a farmer who was, uh, you could say he was quite thrifty. A anybody understand what the word thrifty means? This old farmer was thrifty. Okay, let's put it the way it is. The old guy was tighter than bark on a tree, all right? He still had his third grade lunch money. I mean, he held on to a dollar. He loved it. That's what it was all about. Well, one day the farmer got to thinking about his, his money and old Pete. And he was thinking, it's costing me a lot of money to keep old Pete fed. So he started weighing his options. And he decided, I can't get rid of old Pete. He's too valuable. I use him every day around the farm. So he decided that he would cut his feeding costs by mixing in a little sawdust with old Pete's oats. Well, he tried it the next day. Old Pete didn't seem to mind. 
He just kept eating. So every day, the farmer would change the percentage. He'd put in a little more sawdust and a little less oats. After a few weeks, guess what? Old Pete was eating nothing but sawdust. One week later, old Pete was dead. Church, that's the way worldliness creeps into your life. A little bit at a time. None of us wake up in the morning and go, well, I'm going to have a, you know, a secular world view, even though I'm a Christian. We don't do that. But it seeks into us, seeps into us, uh, you know, bite by bite, bit by bit. We become desensitized. We start accepting the values, the things popular in our culture. And let me say this, beloved, just because our culture accepts it doesn't mean it's right. Okay? Now, I could get real preachy here, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to leave it like that. Just because, you know, people say, well, that's fine and that's good, it doesn't mean God's okay with it. All right? But we start accepting the world's values and the ideals, and spiritually, we die. I've seen people grow up in church who had a good, spiritual, godly, Jesus Christ filled foundation. And then they grow up and they leave the home and they get out in the world. And by the time they're in their 30s, they don't even recognize God anymore. Because it's seeped into them. They've been consumed by the world. So here's what I came to talk about this morning. And this is, this is for people who are serious about their walk with Christ. Because like I said, there's a lot of people sitting in this room. There's a lot of people watching on Facebook. They're comfortable. You're comfortable with living in the world. This is for people who want to love God and not the world. How do we avoid this? Being consumed. Being indoctrinated by the world. Well, first and foremost, there has to be a desire for God. A desire to love Him. Unfortunately, a whole lot of church folk like that desire. They, they're, they're content to sit on the, on the fence, one foot in church and one, one foot loving the world and the things in it. The, God has blessed a lot of us. And we're thinking, now preacher, I understand about loving God, but I got some really good stuff that he's blessed us with here. And we really like our stuff, or, or I like my lifestyle, or I like this idea of doing this or this. You know what we call those people? Theologians call them carnal Christians, fleshly Christians. They put their faith in Jesus Christ, but they haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to renew their minds. So they still think and still act and still operate like the world according to their flesh. Now, let me talk to those who do have that desire to love God. The, the people who are serious about God. Who want to love God more than anything else. Then John gives us three things here that we need to be looking out for. Three things. We find them in verse 16. Number one, he says, watch out for the lust of the flesh. Watch out for the lust of the flesh. If your flesh constantly controls you, if you find yourself almost daily or weekly losing your temper, cussing and fussing and carrying on when you're supposed to be a quote-unquote good Christian, a believer, then you're dealing with lust of the flesh. You're letting your flesh control you. If if, if, if you're trying to, to be the person God wants you to be, but you keep going back to those old, old habits, those old things, those old way of, of, of living, then you're being controlled by your flesh. If your physical desires, if, if they drive you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're drawn to people you shouldn't be drawn to because you're a happily married person, then the, the flesh, is it's eating you up. 
you, you belong, beloved, let me just say, you belong to the world. The world has consumed you. It, it, it owns you. It has a grip on you. Number two, it says, watch out for the lust of the eyes. John says, watch out for the lust of the eyes. Now, this may come as a surprise to you, and it did me years ago when I first really got into this scripture. You know, I thought John was talking about, when he said lust of the eyes, I thought he was talking about, uh, for me personally, seeing a pretty girl walk by me going, whoa, hey, you know, that's lust. The no, that's not what he's talking about. That goes in the prior category. That, that's lust of the flesh. Okay? Let me, let, me, let me open this up to somebody right here. What John is talking about when he says, watch out for the lust of the eyes, he's talking about an obsession with possessions. An obsession with possessions. I see it. I want it. Anybody ever been there? I see it. I, we got one honest man here. He went, yeah, brother. Yeah, brother. Well, I'm going to go ahead and confess to you. I, I fight that. Lust of the eyes. And, 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 I, and I, I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to shoot. Let's just get real here this morning. I, I'll tell you where I, where I struggle. I, I, last year, my, uh, my older son got married. And uh, he'd been driving the same vehicle through high school and college. And, I mean, it was on his last leg. And a week before he got married, he decided, I think we need to get us another car so we can at least go on a honeymoon. Okay? So Tammy and I agreed, yeah, we'll, we'll go. We'll, we'll, we'll help you with this thing. We'll do that. So we go out to Boyd Chevrolet Cadillac. And he finds him a nice little Malibu for him and Haley. Perfect little car. And they're in there doing the paperwork. Well, and that takes a little while. While they're doing the paperwork, I decide I'm going to stroll through the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a weakness. <laughs> Grayson, you got one. Tim, you got one. Todd, you got one. Don't let me just talk to the boys. Girls, y'all got weaknesses too. <laughs> I'm walking through the parking lot. <laughs> there she was. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I had, to, I, I had to stop and lean against another car for a minute because she, she took my breath. <laughs> Baby. Talk to me, honey. Talk to me. I, it was, I don't remember the, it was a Cadillac X, ecstasy to me, baby. I don't know. It was, it was, it was bad to the bone, Greg. Charcoal gray had the wide tires, V8 engine in it, y'all. This day and age, this thing was bad. I love my wife. But if I could have got some trade-in value for her. <laughs> she'd have been out on that lot with a for sale side. <laughs> I'd have traded that girl in. Now, I'm being funny. But I'm telling you the truth. Because listen, folks. <laughs> I could not afford this car. I think it was, Seth, you'll have to, it was 80000 it was, it was, It was a bunch of money. But, Kurt, for a minute, I thought about it. <laughs> I can sell this. I can give blood. I can, I can make this thing happen because I'd look good in this car. Okay? Lust of the eyes. Now, see, for, for me, you, you know, you show me a car or a truck, I... You know, I, I, I get a little crazy. Now, see, like I said, now, every one of us has something. Every one of you has something. I'm being serious now. And listen to this. Satan has studied you and I. He knows our weakness. And he will constantly put in front of us what will make us lust, make us want it. 
Did you know that your eyes have an appetite? Your eyes have an appetite. That's why people come to you and go, feast your eyes on this. The devil knows it. Look at this. Look at this. Our eyes, it's, it's not our brains. It's not other organs that Satan tempts us with. First, it's our eyes. And he's been doing it for millennia. He did it to Eve. The very first sin, he started with Eve's eyes. Think about it. You don't have, it's in the book of Genesis. You don't have to read far. So, Pastor Bill, you say, I thought you don't have to read far. <laughs> Just go. Part of the reason Eve listened to the serpent, listened to Satan in the Garden of Eden, because she looked at the forbidden fruit, and it says in there, it was pleasant. It was pleasing to her eyes. And Satan's been doing it ever since. Listen, the devil's tactics have never changed. A lot of you are going, boy, I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the lookout for the devil. I, you know, No, you don't have to look out for him. You know what he's going to do. He's going to put your weakness in front of you. His M.O. has always been the same. Show somebody something desirable and they'll bite every time. That's what you need to look out for. What is your weakness? What is it you, what is it that you would give something up for to get? Folks, listen. The world owns us when our possessions... Our clothes, our cars, our homes, our land, our stuff mean more to us than anything else. If what you drove the church in means more to you than just about anything else, then the world owns you. What do you think the most what do you think the most precious thing on this earth is? What do you think it is? The most valuable, most precious thing in the world. What do you think it is? Gold? Silver, gasoline today, blood, life, time. No, 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 no. I'm convinced. I, I know what the most valuable thing in the world is. I know it. It's grass. It's grass. Grass is the most important thing to people in the whole wide world. Grass. I work construction. I know. You pull up on a job, if you touch the neighbor's grass, <laughs> Tim, am I, am I preaching truth today, brother? You ain't never been cussed till you touch somebody's grass. Greg, am I, am I preaching truth, brother? Do not touch my grass. You can touch my wife, you can kick my dog, but do not touch my grass. I deal with that every week on my day job. Do not touch my grass. Now, you think I'm being funny, but I've seen families destroyed over a piece of grass. I know, I know parents... And children who will not speak to each other. Brothers and sisters who have broken up years before because of a piece of grass. Something that they cannot take with them when they die. But by George, we're going to fight about it till we do. I believe God stands in heaven and goes, Really? Really? You ought to see what I've got up here for you. And you're worried about an acre of land down there that's going to be destroyed anyway. Church, listen. If you'll give up a friend or a family member over a material possession, then the world owns you. You love the world more than you love God. Number three. Watch out for the pride of life. 
Watch out for the pride of life. Friend, if you're more concerned about what your boss thinks about you, what your friends think about you, even what your family thinks about you, then you do what God thinks about you. If you live to impress and please people more than God, then you love the world more than you love God. That's as simple as I can put it. Who are you living to please? People or God? If it's people, then you have the pride of life in your heart. And you love the world more than you love God. Beloved, I learned a long time ago being in the ministry. People are really hard to please. Amen? People are really hard to please. In fact, I could bring up something right now. Just, just off the top of my head. Say, As a church, we're going to do this. Half of you would love it. Half of you would hate it. Why? Because you can't please people. I learned a long time ago, and I hope most of you have too, you can't please people, you got to please God. Can I be personal with you? There have been times in my ministry and in my life that Tammy and I have actually gotten into arguments because I felt like God wanted me to do this. But she said, I think we ought to do that. But I've stuck to my guns and said, I really feel like the Lord wants us to do this. And, and, and we, we've done that. See, I, as much as I love this woman right here, and I, I love her more than anybody else in this world, I cannot live to please her. Are, are you hearing me, husbands and wives? I cannot live to please her. I have to please God. But if I'll please God, ultimately I'll please her. Are you with me? Okay. The closer you get to God, the closer you and your spouse will get. Even if you're at odds, you'll end up in the same place. That was free. That was not in my notes today. <laughs> Let me close with a warning. And then I'm going to close with an awesome promise. Okay? It's found in verse 17. Here's the warning. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. Everything that you love about this world, everything that you're investing into this world is going to pass away. This thing that you think you've got to have, that, that affair, that person, that action, that whatever it is that you've got to do, it will pass away. Here's what God says. If you're living for the world and all the stuff it has to offer, then enjoy it as fully as you can. You go out there, listen, if you're going to love the world, then you, get, you jump into it with both feet. Just, I mean, I'm telling you as a pastor, you just you jump into it and you get it. And you live it up and then you enjoy it and you climb those ladders and you accumulate things and you gather and you store and you build bigger barns just to keep your stuff and you do all of this stuff. You do it because that's all you're ever going to have. That's all you'll ever have. And when you're gone, it will be too. That's the warning. Here's the awesome promise. But he that doeth the will of God abideth or liveth forever. Man, I like that. I like that. If we live for him, listen to this church, the world and all it has to offer cannot compare to what he has for us. The Apostle Paul, God opened the veil for Paul to look into heaven one time. Read about it. It was so awesome. And Paul was an educated man. Intelligent man. But all he could say about it was, Eyes not seen nor ear heard. Neither has entered into the imagination the things that God has prepared for those who love him. 
Church, here's a question. Here's where we close. Do you love God or do you love the world? Pastor, is it really worth it to, to love God and, and, and not love all the things in this world? Yeah, oh, yeah, it is. Because, see, we don't have to. Here's where a bunch of us Christians get, get messed up. We think that only the good comes after we die. Amen? Well, when I die, I get heaven. When I die, that's when I get all of this. Until then, I just got to trudge through life and be a good little Christian. No, that's not the way it works at all. Jesus said, if we seek him first, he's going to supply all these things to us. A amen? And I think Jesus also promised us an abundant, full life. Right here, right now, didn't he? Let me tell you something. I got heaven coming, but I get a little bit of heaven here on earth too. Because God's pretty dad burn good. Amen? Stand up this morning, please. Donna's going to come up. She's going to play just a little song for us. And as she plays, I'm going to ask.